Well, one time when I was in college, some buddies of mine and I decided to spend spring break in San Miguel de Allende, a little town about an hour and a half north of Mexico City. And so we drove down to Nuevo Laredo on the Texas-Mexico border, jumped on a bus that drove through the night, and we woke up in this little artist colony. And I remember we checked into our hotel, and uh, that night we got up on the roof of our hotel, and it connected to La Perroquia, this massive uh, neo-Gothic cathedral that dominated the skyline in the center of the city. And so I'll never forget sitting on that rooftop of this gorgeous church, listening to, there was a men's choir downstairs that was singing hymns in Latin. And as they began to sing these beautiful hymns, looking out over this gorgeous architecture, over this colorful, artistic city, as the sun set and exploded into color, I remember the first time I felt like there was so much beauty, it made my heart ache. And I remember as a young man going, this is unbelievable. And I instinctively thought, man, I wish I had someone to share this with. And I was there with my buddy Ricardo. (laughs) But I remember as I felt that, I was like, that's not what I meant. Like Rick's a good dude. But I remember thinking, I want to share life with somebody. I want to be with a woman I can walk with through life. And I remember for me, I had never like assumed I would get married because that felt like presumption, like God owes me a wife and he doesn't. God owes me nothing. And yet for that first time, I thought, man, but I would, I really want one. I really want to be married. And I felt a longing that many of you feel very intensely even now. I want to pair off in a journey with someone. And I want to say right at the beginning, as we've been marching through this series of singleness and now round the horn of dating into engagement, that longing to pair off is good. Actually, in this text, it was pre-fall that before the fall of man, before sin entered, Adam felt that longing. I want to be with somebody. It's not good that I'm alone. And so then God sent him all these animals and he was like, you know, that's not what I meant. Like a cool moose is great. And you know, like it's great to hang with the raccoons, but that's not what I'm looking for. And when God introduced him to Eve, he said, at last, someone who's a compliment to me, someone who can help each other as we journey into all that God has for us together. That longing to pair off is good. The question we're asking today is, how do we do it well? And the honest answer today is, in our modern age, that's become more complicated. Adam, God just knocked him out. When he woke up, God was leading a naked woman towards him, and he broke into poetry. Worked out real well. But society has changed a lot in our days today, and it's brought in a lot of ambiguity. David Brooks, who's a columnist for the New York Times, said this. He said, young people today hit puberty around 13 and don't get married until past 30. That's two decades of coupling, uncoupling, hooking up, relationships, shopping around. This period isn't a transition anymore. It's a sprawling life stage, and nobody knows the rules. He said, once young people came a call in as part of courtship, then they had dating and going steady, but the rules of courtship have dissolved. They've been replaced by ambiguity and uncertainty. Cell phones, Facebook, text messages give people access to hundreds of friends, but that only increases the fluidity, drama, and anxiety. And as someone who's had the privilege to minister among young people, I've seen that, that something that should be associated with words like exciting and suspenseful and thrilling, meeting someone to pair off with for life, I hear more often explained as stressful, depressing. This should motivate poetry, not anxiety. And yet in our modern world today, it's difficult. And so we talked last week about who you should date, that the desire to pair off is good, but you want to pair off with the right person. And we talked about that far and away, the most important characteristic is someone who's chasing the same cause. If you're going to link hands and run with someone until death do you part, you want to be going the same direction in life. You want to be lockstep on the biggest decisions in life. Who do we think made this world? What's it for? What does he value? Because that'll shape my values. I want to chase him. So if you know Jesus, you want to link up with someone who knows him too and loves him. You want to chase the same cause. And then when you get that person, you got to look and say, do they have a God chiseled character? Are they letting God shape who they are? Do they have a basis of morality outside of our relationship so that when I'm at my worst, they will still be honest with me and caring and gentle and kind because they have a foundation of morality external from our relationship. You want someone with a God-shaped character. And then you look for chemistry. Are they funny? 
Do they make me laugh? Do we like hanging out? Because much of life is just hanging out. And if you find them boring, don't do that, right? (laughs) And so we said that's kind of basic principles of who you're looking for. Now today, we need to talk about how. What's the method you link up to that person? So that's who you're looking for. You're not looking for a soulmate. In the sense of, you're not looking for someone who will complete you as if you're this incomplete person that won't be complete until you meet them. That's not how God made humanity. If that's the case, then Jesus was incomplete and just never maximized his potential and no one's willing to say that. No, you are complete and it is entirely possible for you to fulfill your God-given destiny as a single person. Single on the front end of life or even single if you're widowed or divorced. You have purpose and God can accomplish those purposes through you. And so you're not incomplete, but what you're meant to do is run into God's purposes and a great joy is being able to link hands and do it with someone else. And that linking of hands, there's different things to call it, but that journey from singleness into marriage, you pass through something called evaluation. Evaluating are we meant to grip hands and run together. Right? It's not a status to sit in. It is a process to move through. And there's been different processes throughout history. In the past and in many cultures today, parents take the lead in helping a child find the right person and evaluating who they should link up with and run with. In our modern society in America, it is dating. We spend time together. And what's the purpose of dating? Dating is for evaluation. What am I evaluating? Whether we're meant to link hands and run together. So dating is not a status we sit in. It is a process we move through. And the reality is in our culture today, many people instantly associate dating with drama. It's supposed to be tumultuous and chaotic. You listen to every song on the radio today and it's, I love you, I hate you, I love you and hate you. And you're like, it's, it's not meant to, it doesn't have to be that way. I knew you were trouble when you walked in. (laughs) Then why did you date him? Don't, don't. It need not be like this. Life brings enough drama. Don't date drama. Date someone good that you can run into with drama. Don't date crazy. There's enough crazy out there. Date someone who you can face the crazy together with. So even though the seas are tumultuous, there are principles we can navigate by, and that's where we are here. And let me say again, I'm going to talk about seven principles of the how. How do we interact with each other? And again, there's some of you in here that maybe you're happy to be single, or you're married, and you go, oh, good, this isn't about me. And, you know, check out, don't do it, because these are basic principles of how we should treat each other as humanity, and how we should treat one another as believers in Jesus. So the principles here apply to all of us in many ways, and then specifically for us as we think about how do we pair off and begin to discern, are we meant to run together for a lifetime? So let me give you seven principles of how. The first one of how you should date, I would say you need to date prayerfully. Prayerfully. Romans 8.28 says, We know God works all things for the good of those who love him, and are called according to his purpose. Paul says, there's a group of us, and we know that God works all things, and he works them for good for those of us who love him. 1 Peter 5 says, cast all your cares on him, because he cares about you. 1 John 4 says, we have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us, and there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Do you hear what's happening in those verses? For many of us, we enter into our horizontal relationships like it's all on us. I gotta impress that person to get the job. I gotta wow you in order for you to be interested in me. And we come in with an anxiety of I gotta work it in order to get your intention. But confidence in God takes the desperation out of dating. That suddenly I go, God is in the equation, so it's not all on me. He guides my steps. He determines my path and he loves me. He's gonna take care of me. And when I begin to believe that, that perfect love casts out fear. He's working all things for the good for those who love him. And that confidence in God takes the desperation out of dating. It doesn't free you from making decisions, but it does free you up to make good ones. The longest chapter in Genesis was about this pairing off, Genesis 24. And back then, it was the dad who took the lead in helping pair off. And it was Abraham looking at his servant and saying, it's time to go find a wife for my son Isaac. And he told him, hey, go to the old country. People who believe in God, unite my son with a woman who fears the same Lord that he does. And the servant gets nervous. Well, what if I can't find her? What if she won't come back? What if she won't journey with you? What if she won't live on the cutting edge of faith with him? And Abraham stops him and says, hey, the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, who called me to this land 
and said to your offspring, I will give this land. He says, that God will lead you and you'll find a wife. And if you don't, you're free from my oath. But don't try to take my son back there. And I love his calm there. Hey, God's gonna take care of you and give him a wife or God's not going to. But either way, I'm not gonna onboard a lot of anxiety. There's a liberty in that. God is in the equation. God is part of my story. God cares about you. And when you know that, you don't get to know all things, but you know the one who controls all things. And that's a comforting thought. So when you become Ruth out in the field, You can work the field of grain because it's right, but you don't have to work it in the field of grain to get Boaz's attention. Like, oh, Boaz is coming by. Oh, okay, hey, just picking grain. Like, you don't have to be weird. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, including dating, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. So we start prayerfully. I invite you in to this process, Lord. That's a great place to start. And so you decide, I am chasing after him. I am running after the Lord. And as I run after him, a lot of cute, eligible people are gonna be running different directions. I let them go right by. I'm chasing him. And as I run after him, I'm running with a community. And I'm gonna see some of them become mentors. Some of them become brothers and sisters. Some of them are gonna be cute and have some potential. And so I need to run up next to them And point two is you initiate with clarity. That I begin prayerfully and then I initiate with clarity. One of the greatest stresses in modern dating today is the lack of clarity. I don't know where we stand. And that lack of clarity produces anxiety. It's one of the things that's driven many people to online dating, which I don't want to talk a lot about it, but but many people go, well, then at least I know it's a date. And there's some dangers with online dating. I don't think it's all bad, but there's some dangers. We don't have time to get into all that. But the reality is some of them go, well, at least there's some clarity on what it is potentially more than it's out there in the world today. But I would encourage you, we need to initiate with clarity. And why do I say it that way? Well, it's interesting. Ephesians 4 is just talking about believers in general, people who have an allegiance to God. And he says about the way we talk to each other. He says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow into the head. He says, when you have an allegiance to Jesus, you have an allegiance to his people. And that allegiance is, I will be honest with you. I will speak the truth to you and I will speak it in a loving way. And I will do it with an aim that you would grow into all you're meant to be under God. That's the commitment we make to each other. That's what makes the community so beautiful. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna deceive you. I'm not gonna be vague. I'm gonna speak the truth, but not in a harsh way. I'm gonna speak the truth with love, with a redemptive goal. And as we all do that to each other, we all grow and develop together, speaking the truth with love. And I would take it a step further, not just speaking the truth with love, speaking the truth is love. Proverbs 24, 26 says, an honest answer is a kiss on the lips. If I'm honest with you, it's a way to be gracious to you, to kind to you, because now I know where we stand. Ambiguity produces anxiety, and so clarity is a kindness. It is a way to love you. So I initiate with clarity. And men, this falls largely on you. Is that fair? Is that the way it should be? Is that a biblical mandate? Not necessarily. I mean, you do have texts like Proverbs that say a man who finds a wife finds a good thing. So the verb is there for the man to go find the wife. So I think there's probably some argument there. But the most asked question I get is can women initiate a date? And the truth is you got Ruth with Boaz. She was working in the field. Boaz wasn't making a move. And so she went over to the threshing floor and was like, hey, I'm curious. Are we doing this? What's going on? And uh, he wasn't like, shame on you. Uh, He was like, this woman's awesome. And uh, he just thought she was out of his league. And he was like, I am moving now. And he got some things done. And she was called a righteous woman. And so I don't think it's wrong. And yet, as you look through the Bible, there is a call for men to have courage and be courageous. And as you just look across the culture, it's interesting. There was a survey done in 2012 that said only 12% of American women asked a man out on a date in the previous year. So let me just say, that wasn't just religious people. That was of all people. Guys, women want men to initiate. They want men to be the initiators with clarity. And they prefer you do it face to face. It's interesting as you look at different surveys, and I did my own. Some like texts, some don't. Some prefer calling, some don't. But the one you get the most of men is looking at them in the face. And they almost universally hate being asked to hang out. 
I've just found it's very vague and frustrating to a lot of women. So I asked, I did focus groups on this man. And so I asked him, well, what would you rather have them say? Do you want him to say the word date? Is that old fashioned? And they said, no, because now at least I know what it is. And I know how to get dressed, right? <laughs> so they said, I prefer the word date. They said, or plan a thing and then invite me to go do that thing. And then at least I know what I'm getting into, have clarity with the initiation. I, I did this with Donna after making many mistakes in dating. So don't let me present myself as if I'm a hero. There are still many people I know, good friends with, that think the fact that I'm talking about and wrote a book about dating, they find endlessly hilarious <laughs> because my previous dating would be best described as well, dumpster fire. But <laughs> I only had to get it right once. But um, uh, with Donna... I remember when we first met, we were hanging out in a community of believers, which is where I'd hope you would meet people. It's a, and uh, as we were kind of in these sister churches, our orbits overlapped. I got to watch her life. She got to watch mine. And there was a moment where I wanted to get to know her better specifically, but I didn't know her very well. So there was a group of us going to a movie. And I said, hey, a group of us are going. Would y'all like to go? And we kind of united our groups to go do something together. I conveniently left the seat by me open, <laughs> but it wasn't a date. But after that time, I really enjoyed hanging out with her. And so I asked her, can I call you? And then I called her and said, hey, my brother has this New Year's event going on and uh, I want to go and I need to bring a date. Would you be my date to this New Year's thing? Because I wanted her to know what she was getting into. She said, yes. And so we went to it. And at the end of that, I wanted to give clarity, not just initiation, but in clarity with intention. I got to the end of that and said, hey, I really enjoyed tonight. Do you mind if I call you again? And I did that because I knew a lot of girls that they would maybe have a nice time with a guy and get out and leave and go, so what happens now? Am I supposed to call him? Does he call me? Am I supposed to text him? Does he text me? Do I just talk him online? Should I comment or should I not comment? Is that desperate? Do I DM or do I not DM? Is that too personal? And they're just not sure what to do. I just wanted to eliminate the drama so that she'd know he'll call me. And I called her and I said, hey, there's a play downtown I'd like to see. Would you go with me to a play? And we never made it to the play. About midway through it, we got an emergency phone call from some friends there in the hospital, and so we pivoted. But that was part of the evaluation of dating, of realizing, hey, are you willing to go with me when suddenly ministry calls and we got to care for some people? And she was, and that was pretty helpful. But, but what I tried to do was give her clarity along the way that she always knew where she stood. Now, that doesn't mean on date one you walk up and go, I would like to initiate courtship now. Like, that's, <laughs> no, man, don't do it. But... Date three, four, five, you may want to sit down and, and I would typically do it in the car. Just say, hey, I'm really enjoying getting to know you and um, I'm not trying to get married like this month, but I'm also not just messing around. Um, you seem like the kind of person I could see myself doing life with. And so do you mind if I keep calling you? And I just wanted to give her permission to respond and clarity as to where I was at. And then I gave her clarity on an exit. I said, but if at any point in this process you feel uncomfortable, let me know and we can stop. I trust God with my life and I trust him with yours. And so I didn't want to be clingy and desperate. I'm like, I trust God with his leading of me and I trust him with his leading of you. So I wanted to give clarity in initiation, clarity in where we were and clarity in exit. You can exit if you want to. And she would say, no, I don't want to. And so we journeyed together. But ladies, this is where you come in as well. That Clarity is helpful. It takes courage to ask a girl out. And historically, you can read a lot of studies on it. Guys were better at it in the past because they did it a lot. And there's even different cultures. I remember for me, I had a buddy from West Texas that uh, we were talking about growing up. And he was like, man, the town I would go to every Friday night, there was a big town dance. And the expectation was you would ask a date. And so I was asking a girl to be my date every single Friday. And I was like, He's my age. I'm like, what was it like a Dharma initiative? Like, where were you? Like, what is this like backwards town? Like, where you do this? A date's on Friday night. And then we went to France. Donna and I we were in this little village in France. And these people were like, hey, every Friday night, the town shuts down and we have a big dance and everyone invites a date. And I was like, oh, this is like a human thing. <laughs> and across cultures, communities used to create environments that would encourage men to initiate with women. And so guys got better at it just because they got more reps. You know what I mean? They're just getting good at it. And they'd be like, do you want to go? No. Okay, that hurt. Oh, I survived it. And I move on. And suddenly it's not that scary. I just, you know, every week it's coming back around. Nowadays, there's less of that. And so a lot of guys feel like fear initiating because it's just like 
this guy's pitched a hundred times. I've pitched once. It feels like the wrong arm. Like, oh man, it feels bad. And you don't need to shame him for that. The culture's done that. The screens have done that and the phones have done that. They've made initiating awkward. And so let's not shame each other about that. Let's acknowledge this current situation is not our fault, but it is our problem. And so if a guy initiates with you, give him the gift of clarity. I remember I talked with a group of young people as I discussed this. And one guy was like, yeah, there was a girl in my church. I thought she was awesome. So I told her, hey, would you like to go to dinner with me? And she said, is it a date? And he said, yeah. And she said, no. She said, uh, she said I think we'd have a good time because you're really fun, but I don't really see us going anywhere. And when she said that, he said that to a room full of people, they responded like some of you. They were like, oh, he was like, no, I loved it. He said, because now I knew where we stood. She didn't waste my time. She didn't just ghost me and not get back to me for like a month and leave me wondering and come up with reasons why I'm insufficient. She just said, I don't see us that way. And now I knew, and it was a way to respect him, right? That an honest answer is a kiss on the lips. It's a way to love people, to be honest with them. An initiating, an intention, and an exit. You got that? We're gonna move a little quicker, all right? (laughs) Number three is we date with autonomy. Autonomy. You go, what do you mean by that? Well, if you look in the Bible, there's different categories of people that have different expectations as to how they treat each other. The biggest categories are believers in Jesus and those who are not. And the Bible's pretty clear on how those two categories relate. Christians are meant to love everybody, even all the way to their enemies. We're meant to love everybody, live life among them, seek the good of the city, flourishing of people, whether they believe what we believe about Jesus or not. We're meant to love all people, work together, do life. We're meant to do that. But on the biggest issues of life, you're not yoked together with unbelievers. The tightest of business deals and in marriage. We talked about that last week, that there's a division there. If someone doesn't believe what you do about God, you don't get married because your lives are going different directions so you don't need to date. But then once you limit the pool into the people that have that same allegiance, you look in the pool and the Bible's pretty clear that people who have faith in Jesus, the Bible calls us brother and sister. And there's all kinds of passages about how brothers and sisters are supposed to treat each other, encourage one another as long as it's called today, stir one another up to love and good deeds, that we're meant to bless one another and that sort of thing. And then there's this other category called husband and wife that have this whole different set of expectations as to how they treat each other. But what you see in modern dating today is people trying to create this interim space. Well, you and I are more than just brother and sister, but I don't want to take on the freight of marriage. And so let's call it something else. Let's call it talking, or let's call it boyfriend and girlfriend. And frankly, I don't care what you call it or use those terms, but what they mean by this interim space is it imports some responsibilities into my life and some benefits to my life that are in marriage without breaking off the whole thing. So some responsibilities, like I'll have girls come up to me and say, hey, my boyfriend doesn't go to church with me. Can you tell him he should go to church with me? Like dating creates this should. Or they'll say, hey, I think that we should do our devotional life together. Should we do that? That sort of thing. Or they'll say, we've been dating in a while, so that gives me certain privileges, like access to your body. But I don't want to have the responsibility of, you know, loving you in sickness and health, you might become a hassle and I got to get out. And so I want to create the space where I get some benefits, but not all the responsibilities. I get some responsibilities, but I don't take on all the benefits of security and safety of you loving me till death do we part. This space is what's causing so much confusion and pain. And people ask me, what's the biblical mandate on it? And I was like, the Bible doesn't have this category. It, It doesn't of I import some, but not others. It doesn't have it. And so that's confusing. Dating is not a status to sit in. It's a process to move through. It is not a rest stop to pause in for years. It is a road to journey through to see where we're meant to end up together. It is not something you secure to feel safety. It is proximity for the purpose of evaluation. And so if I'm evaluating their life, I'm not trying to mesh our lives too deeply. Dating is about evaluating, is this the kind of person I want to run with? So there's a sense of separation. Brother and sister, there is some separation between us. So when Donna and I dated, I wasn't trying to get her to move to the town that I felt God called me to. She's not married to me. You live wherever you want to live. You do whatever you want to do. You go where God's called you to go. Yes, we're spending time together because we might be in locking into forever. But until I tell you, I want all of you forever until death do us part, you have no allegiance to me. 
And so that creates some tension. And I have people say that. They're like, won't that create tension? Didn't you want the resolution of just like moving in together and maybe sleeping together and having all that? You're like, of course you want that resolution. But that tension is what propels you through the process. It makes you get on or get off. I'm going, are we serious about this or not? And it's interesting as you look at all the different studies today, this is where most of the stress lives is people want to import certain responsibilities, but not all of them. And so we languish in ambiguity. And it's fascinating as I read various studies, Mark Regneris did kind of the biggest one. If you have trouble sleeping at night, I highly recommend his book because it's, it's a lot of statistics about modern dating. And as he looks at these different statistics, he says the mode experience for most is to introduce sexuality before any promise of a relationship. He said, so sex comes in early and relationship comes in later. And this is what he said. This has become common to young, young people. Sex early on, before any expression of love, an underdeveloped interest in sacrificing on behalf of the other, accounts of overlapping partners, much drama, and in the end, nothing but mixed memories and expired time. And as he talks about that, he said, many people, they've sort of pseudo-knit together their lives, but not all the way, so they languish for years. And a frustration begins to grow of where is this going? And particularly among women, that frustration grows. He interviews a number of people from different cities in America, Washington, D.C. being one of them. And one of his case studies was a girl that she's like, you know, I'm living in New York and I'm mixing it in with these different guys, but as I'm approaching 30, I, I, want, I want a companion in life but I'm having these intense sexual experiences and then I don't know if we're gonna be together or not and then it doesn't really work and we move into each other, but I don't really know you. And as I get to know you, I go, I don't think I wanna be with you, but now we've journeyed for months and, and we're just languishing in this space where we've enmeshed our lives before I know if you're someone worthy of all of me. And that enmeshing is hurting, it's costing us and realizing this isn't really what I wanna live. So he asked her, what's your ideal? And she said, well, some guys I'm sleeping with right away. And he said, are those the guys you're interested in? And she said, no, they're the guys I'm the least interested in. She said, the one I'm interested in, I hold sex back. And he was like, why? And he said, because sex complicates things. And that's the fourth point that we date with purity. And she said, sex complicates things. A girl with not any spiritual experience, she just said, I just know when you introduce sexuality, it's such an intense human experience that it throws off the evaluating if I even like this person. She said, so it complicates the, the evaluation. And so we asked her, what's the ideal? And she said, the ideal would be to hold off sexuality and hold our lives separate to see, do we like each other? Do we enjoy hanging out? Do you make me laugh? Do I trust you? Let's build a friendship and let's let that friendship be the foundation. And then upon that foundation of friendship, affection grows and romance. And then sex is the consummation of the marriage. It's not the introduction of the relationship, it's the consummation that says, I want all of you, not just emotionally and not just financially and physically in life, I now want you sexually. We consummate this covenant we've made with one another. She said, that's what I would prefer, but she just didn't think it was realistic. And it's interesting, Donna Fritas found the same thing as she studied college students. She said the hookup culture of sex early on without really relationship, she said when she interviewed students from all over America, the highest praise it received was the word fine, that most people didn't really enjoy it. And she said, so I asked people, what would you like? And she said, far and away, they wanted romance, they wanted talking, they wanted to be known. And of course, people want to have sex, but with someone who's worthy of all of them. And so it's interesting in the Bible, you know, Paul will speak to this issue. He quotes that Genesis passage we talked about where he warns us in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, don't you know those who've joined with a prostitute become one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, flees sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits outside the body, but sexually immoral person sins against his own body. He says, when you unite your bodies too fast, now we know chemically what happens. It releases dopamine into the system and oxytocin. Dopamine is the happy chemical that says, whatever you did, do a lot of that. And oxytocin is a hormone that produces bonding. Same hormones released when a mom nurses a baby. That's why there's no such thing as casual sex. It's such an intense human experience that it bonds you together. But if you initiate it too early, you get this bond where you're literally looking forward to doing it again. You wanna be around that person, but you haven't asked the question of, do I like hanging out with them? Would I want to live in the same house and talk to you every day for 50 years? But we're together and for longer periods of time because of this intensity of this physical experience we're having. But as the intensity of that wears off, maybe a few years go by and you go, you know what? I don't think we're a good fit relationally. And that's a shame. That's sad. 
And so we're meant to hold that back, not to hurt us. And this is always the dangerous part of the talk because people are like, man, is this guy promoting sexual purity like a Puritan? Like everyone, I'm gonna, we're passing out purity rings on the way out the door. Like, is that what he's saying? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is God built the human machine and he knows how it works best. And he gave us sex as a gift. It was his idea, you know, uh, it really was. When Adam and Eve, he brought them together, he was excited about that. He said, be fruitful and multiply. It's the first command. He said, get after it, guys. Like God was for it. But he said, I want you to do it in a way that you're not just binding together your bodies. You're binding together all of you. A radical donation to somebody who says, I want all of you. So hold the sexuality back because that's the part you're probably the most confident will work out. Let's figure out all the other pieces first of are we knit together in every other way? And then we consummate it sexually in marriage. That's the idea. Do you see that? It's interesting. I have so many people ask me, uh, hey, you keep advocating dating within a Christian community, but what happens if we date and then break up? And then, you know, in the agreement, it's like, who gets the church? Okay, you get the church on every other <laughs> Sunday. How does it work? Well, it's interesting. Psychology Today did a study of the intensity and severity of breakups. And they said the severity of a breakup is not time, tied primarily to how long you date. It's tied to the intensity of the experience. This is psychology, psychology today. It's not a Christian anything. But they said if you bond together sexually too fast, you create a strong bond and you literally, when you break up from that person, your body goes through withdrawal, like from a drug. And that's where you get uh, anxiety, sleepless nights, you get heartache. You literally can make yourself sick gastrointestinally that if you bind your bodies too fast and then break up, it actually hurts you. And that's why Paul was telling the Corinthians, hey, don't be fast to bind your body with someone you don't know because you're doing violence against yourself. And your God loves you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to have sex and the best possible kind. He wants you to give all of your body to someone who wants all of your heart too. And so we date with autonomy. I, I don't have access to you. You don't have access to me. That will create some tension and that creates some wisdom. For Donna and I, we were never alone in her apartment because she was hot and I wanted to touch her. But I wasn't sure if we were gonna live the rest of our days together. So we said, we'll just never be alone uh, together. We'll have some autonomy in our relationship. Paul told Tung Yimit, Young Timothy, treat older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. You don't fool around with your sister, don't fool around with her. So I just kind of waited, and yeah, that produced some tension and made me want to hurry up and decide we're either doing this thing or we're not doing this thing. But that tension is meant to drive you through the evaluation. Does that make sense? So much more to say, but I got to go too fast, and, and that's how that goes. But let me just say this. I know this isn't a room full of virgins. And so you're like, is he trying to shame me? And the answer is no. No. And when Jesus interacted with people who had had a wide variety of sexual experiences, the hand of grace always flagged first, that he loves you. God has purpose for you. And God wants you to enjoy sexuality in a way that lets you flourish, okay? And so God wants to renovate your life from the inside out and then wants you to journey with us in the best possible way, in a pure way, with autonomy and with purity. There's really only one dating experience I got right before Donna. Real dumpster fire with a lot of them, right? And I remember there was one time where my sister was about to come to college. And as my sister was about to come to college, some of my buddies were joking. Hey, man, I'm totally gonna date your sister. I'm coming after her. And they were like, yeah. And I remember I was like, you will not date my sister. <laughs> and I was looking particularly at one guy and he was like, yeah, hey, no, man, I'm gonna date her. I'm like, no, like, uh, like I'll kill you. Like, it's not even a thing. <laughs> And guys all assumed I was being like that macho, like no one dates my sister. And I was like, no, I know that guy. And I watched the way he treated girls and he wasn't good to them. He didn't have their best interests in mind. He wasn't out to see them flourish as women under God. So I was like, there's no way you're getting near my sister, bro. And as they left the lunchroom, I remember one of them just said over his shoulder, like, yeah, man, is anyone ever gonna be good enough to date your sister? And they left. And I remember when he said that, they were walking away. And I was kind of like, well, yes, of course. <laughs> and then I had to stop and think about that. Who would be good enough to date my sister? And I spent a long time alone in that lunchroom. Lunch was over, everyone left, and I just had to ponder, <laughs> who would be good enough for my sister? And I thought, it's the kind of person who would treat her like a sister. That, that I want my experience with my sister's life to be whatever I say or do in her life to help her flourish as a woman under God. That's what I want. And I said, I'd want a guy who treats her that way. And, and then if they figure out, hey, we love each other and are meant for more, now they're husband and wife, whole different universe of verses apply to you. But, but if they're not, 
she's a better person as a result of being in his orbit. And I said, I'd want that kind of guy around her. And I remember it was one of those like Holy Spirit jukes, you know, where the Lord like brought me to that. I'm like, yeah, that's the kind of guy I'd want. And God was like, is that how you're treating women? And I started tearing up because the answer was no, not at all. And I had to repent of the way I was treating women. And I was like, I want to do it differently. And I remember right at the end of college, I dated a girl and we did that. I was like, I don't know if we're supposed to be married or not. So I want some autonomy. Like, let's spend some time together, but we're not going to start touching each other a lot because that'll be exciting. But, but I just want to wait and see. And sure enough, she was chasing the same cause, had a godly character, but the chemistry just wasn't there. After about an hour or two of hanging out, we were both like, everything else good? And after all, I was like, man, we just can't do this. Like, we just don't like hanging out. And so we realized it's not going to work. And so we broke up and it was a little sad. We cried a little bit because there was a lot of good stuff about you. But the reality is we realized, hey, we're not a good fit forever. And I remember thanking God we didn't create this strong bond with somebody that I wasn't meant to journey with. And truthfully, years later, I would continue to see her. And it was awesome for me to be able to look her in the eye and not feel embarrassed at all, to look her husband in the eye and not be embarrassed at all. Yeah, the way I treated her was was, was the way I would want a brother to treat a sister. And I felt good about that with autonomy and with purity. And I was happy about that. I, I wanted that experience and I want you to have that. And so can you date in the same church? Yeah, I think if you do it that way, you can say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's spend some time together. Let's go on some dates, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you go, you know what? Okay, but it, you, it doesn't create that intensity. That's that ripping apart. And what you see in so much of the documentation is a lot of people are getting hurt by that repeated process. And so just know this is coming from a pastor's heart that wants to see the best for you. Uh, number five is we date graciously. Graciously, that we're kind with one another, that I treat you, I'm not a big fan of the word courtship, carries a lot of baggage, but I do like the word courtesy because it comes out of that word court. And it's speaking of a king's court, that I wanna treat you like you're a daughter of the king. I wanna treat you like you're the son of a king because if you're in Christ, you are. And my allegiance to my father in heaven should affect how I treat you. So I don't ghost the king's daughter because I have an allegiance to him. He probably gonna talk to me about it, right? Like, so I'm gonna treat her with honor. So I wanna treat you in a gracious manner, in a kind manner, that you're a better person as a result of intersecting with me, that I've spoken life-giving words to you. I've encouraged you, spurred you on towards love and good deeds, that you're a better person as a result of our connection. I want that experience with people and just quite frankly, dating graciously, choosing to be kind, that is attractive. Proverbs 11 says, a gracious woman attains honor. And so ladies, I remember there was a girl I knew in high school and a girl I knew in college. And both of them were not the most attractive girls in our social circle, which I know is a horrible thing to say, but it's true. There were other girls that were physically hotter than them. But for both of them, it was a fascinating thing to watch. Guys were constantly hitting on them, constantly wanting to date them. Even non-Christian guys would, would be confused by it. They would just be like, I, I love you. And they're like, what, what am I doing? And, and, and they, they were just so kind. I remember one of them, we worked together at a restaurant and she would just help people if they were struggling, clean up with their tables, even though that didn't benefit her financially. Her family owned like a peach orchard. So she'd bring everyone peaches. I don't know, it's just like a thing. She'd just bring us stuff. And everyone was like, you are the kindest person. I love you. And like people... We're drawn to her because of her graciousness. It's a gracious woman that attains honor. And guys, Proverbs 19 says, what is desirable in a man is his kindness. I remember for me, one of the first ministries I was a part of, I had a guy that was leading the ministry that, quite frankly, was not an attractive man. But he had a beautiful wife. And I remember being confused by that. And then he got a hand us off. We had a different Bible study leader who was also not an attractive man, but had a beautiful wife. And I remember pondering these things in my heart, like, how is this so? Uh, and, and finally, I asked one of them about it. I just said, can you, can you explain this to me? I don't really understand it. And he wasn't put off by that. He was like, it's a great question. It's one I've often asked myself. And he said, here's the deal. He said, uh, 
you know, he was like in his 20s, whatever, met this girl. She was gracious, kind, beautiful, amazing. And so he was drawn towards her. And he said, man, before I even had the time to process, I just walked up to her and said, hey, I'd love to get to know you. Can I take you to dinner? And she said, yes. And he was like, man, I had just worked up all this courage and adrenaline to do that. I came back to my room like, woo, she said yes. Woo, woo, we're gonna go on a date. I don't know what to say. Oh my God. And he started having a panic attack. He was like, no, batting out of his league. He was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm about to say. And he said he freaked out, didn't know what to do. He said, I did the only thing I knew to do. And then I don't even know if it's even right. He said he just grabbed a Bible off the shelf and was like, God help. And he read a verse and it was Proverbs 19. What is desirable in a man is his kindness. And he said, whatever happens tonight, I will be kind. And that was his decision. They went on a date, went on another date, another date, and then they were getting married. About a year into their marriage, he said they were laying in bed one night and he looked at her and asked the very same question I had asked. How did this happen? And she said, I just remember you were so kind. You were so kind. And in that moment, he was like, I see you. Yes. It works. It works. That graciousness, kindness, courtesy, someone who's caring for you, that's what you want. And then number six is I think you want community. Community. You one of the most dangerous things about dating today is we pair off too early and we do the entire process of evaluating in isolation. And I don't think that's the best thing. Proverbs 11 will say, where there's no guidance, people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there's safety. There's safety in having people around you who can evaluate if that's a good guy or not. And not just safety, Proverbs 24 says, with many counselors, victory is sure. They can help you. Hey, that's the right person. That is a good person. You need a community around you that you trust. Not just of people that are just slashing off advice whose life isn't really working out great, but people that you say, this person has wisdom. They'd be a good counselor for me. I want them around this relationship. Tell me what you see. So for Donna and I, when we started dating, I remember there were people around that wanted to give us advice. They were so excited because I never dated and suddenly Ben was dating. And so they just wanted to take this little tender flower of our love and like grab it and make it grow and kind of spread out the leaves. And I was like, stop it, it's fragile. So there's all these people I had to isolate from. But there was a few people that I was like, hey, I want you around us. I, I, I want to double date with this couple and I really want you to watch us and see, is this a good fit here? Is this the right thing? I didn't have confidence in myself to make that decision in isolation. And, uh, and for Donna, I remember the first time we really were like, hey, we're going on a date. She was like, well, pick me up at my church. I showed up at her church and there was like 200 people there. <laughs> and she planned it that way and I had to meet all of them. And it took like a couple hours. I'm just like, okay, all right. You know, like my resume, like, okay. You know, I'm sitting down interviewing people. Like she was a part of this ministry that really loved her. And so they wanted to see, is this guy right? And, and I actually really respected that. That, that the, in times past, the community of faith would help each other. And I think we need to do that. Not, not in an overbearing way, but for you to go, who are some counselors that I can say, watch this relationship? Is this happening in a healthy way? I would take her on dates where I'd ask people. I had a guy that was one of my mentors that was great at rappelling. And I said, will you take us rappelling? It'll be a fun date to kind of go rappelling down this mountain. And you'll just get to be around us and then tell me what you see. We need help evaluating, particularly because infatuation throws off our ability to evaluate. Song of Songs, when they get together, they're very excited. She opens up the text by let him kiss me with a kiss of his mouth. She's so excited about this guy. She's like, I want his face on my face. And he's jumping around like a deer pound, pouncing over mountains. He's out of control. And so you see in the text, a couple people begin to speak through the poetry of Song of Solomon, the great love song of romance. You get the woman, you get the man, you get God, and you get the woman's friends. And there's a, you know, a precedent to that. If you want to be your lover, you got to get with her friends, right? <laughs> And you see her friends at one point say, rightly do the maidens love you. That they know she's infatuated, they're not. They're evaluating, not the chemistry, that's clearly there. They're watching your character. And they tell her, that is the right person to set your affections on. You need counselors around you. In the abundance of counsel, there's safety. And in the abundance of counselor, Victory is sure. You want people around you who will journey through the process with you. And the last thing you want is you date patiently. Patiently. I trust the Lord. I believe he's carrying my life forward. And by that, I don't mean you languish in a relationship for years and years and years. But what I mean is, as you're 
holding off your life with a bit of autonomy and that tension's created, you're giving yourself the space to really evaluate, are we meant to be together? Paul told Timothy as he was anointing leaders, don't be hasty in laying on of hands. Don't quickly appoint someone a leader in your community. He says, watch them. Some people's sins go before them. It's obvious they're a mess. He said, others it follows after. Give yourself a time to evaluate, is this the right person to unite with? You need that time. As fast as you can, but as slow as you must. So for Donna and I, we started dating. And in the early days, it was pretty intense. A lot of time together, every single day, talking on the phone, texting. And I know for me, as someone who processes slowly, it was too much. Because I was about to leave my ministry and start seminary. And there was so much ambiguity in my life and uncertainty about where our life was going. And her life seemed like it was going that way and mine this way. And I didn't want to interrupt what God was doing in her life. And I didn't want her to interrupt mine. And I was trying to discern if our lives fit together. I wasn't sure. And it was too much. But we had a summer where her band was going to travel like to 16 different states. And I was going to be handing off my ministry. So I looked at her and I said, hey, let's just not talk on the phone. Let's not see each other in person. And I said, let's write letters. And I mean like old school analog, like get some paper and a pen and write letters and mail them to each other. You know, like literally hand them to a mailman and then he gets in his car and he like drives it to like a room or some other mailman puts it in his car and drives it to where we, like let's, let's do that thing. Grandparents told us about. And so, and then I, I realized she's gonna write 10 notes before I write one. I was like, it's gotta be one for one. I said, you write a letter to me and I'll write a letter back to you. And let's slow this process down so I can evaluate it. I'm not saying everyone should do that, but I, I realized I needed that in my evaluation. So she wrote me a letter and I read it. And I remember I wrote one back, put it in the mail. Four days later, she got it. She wrote me back. I can't read anything you wrote because my penmanship was terrible. <laughs> so she gave me permission to type. And I would type these letters to her of my love and then sign them and send them on. But I remember what I needed to see, no promise of the dopamine hit of her body. None of that physicality. I just needed to see, do I like interacting with her at an emotional and intellectual level? And what I found was I started to look forward to her letters. And I had to ask myself, is that just the comfort of not being alone? Or is it actually her as a person? And I had to wait. And after I realized, after a while, I was like, but I know I'm really looking forward to a letter from her. And it got so crazy. There was a time I remember I was leading a ministry thing in one city and I knew it had been about four days. So I was guessing a letter was coming from her because I couldn't text her and ask. So I was like, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be in my mailbox. I looked at my intern and was like, get in the car, son. And we like drove through the night <laughs> to wake up in the morning and be by the mailbox and be like, is there a letter for me? And I started to see that in myself. I'm looking forward to hearing her heart. And then I remember it was 4th of July. I was on a party on a boat and all these people were laughing and glasses clinking and fireworks going off. And it was a big festive moment out on this lake. But I was just standing at the mess, just staring listfully into the, the darkness. And I remember asking myself, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? And, and I realized, I miss her and I want to be with her. And, and I loved being single. And so I was looking and being like, man, you're going to lose a lot of autonomy, bro. You're going to lose uh, all these benefits of singleness. But I started processing with her and I was like, I, she's better. And, and it took me some months. It took slowing the process down for me to discern that in myself. But as we evaluate, I'm like, I, I want to run with her even if everything's better or if it gets worse. If she gets sick or I get sick or we stay healthy, uh, until death, I, I want that. And then I wasted no time. And I got a ring quick, and I realized, how fast can you put together a wedding? Let's speed it up by three months, right? Like, <laughs> let's get this thing done, right? So go as slow as you have to, as fast as you can, to evaluate, are we meant to grab hands and run together? But trust God with it. Trust him with your story. He cares. He cares about your heart. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. And then let's walk into a community like this and let's love each other sincerely. Let's speak the truth to one another in love so that in all things together we grow into the head that is Christ. Whether we end up being each other's mentors, 
being each other's friends, being each other's brothers in arms and sisters in arms as we go through the battles of life or whether some of us end up being lovers. Let's journey together in a way that all of us flourish because we all walk together after our great king who loved us and gave everything for us. He did not hold back. He sacrificed everything for us and so we gladly give all back to him. That's the relationship God has with us. Then we journey together and by his grace, he'll put you together with the right person in the right way in the right time.